In the year 211 BC, the situation around Capua dominated the Roman Senate's deliberations. Every available resource was committed to its capture. Two new consuls were elected, but Quintus Fulvius Flaccus and Appius Claudius retained command of their legions as proconsuls and were instructed by the Senate to maintain the siege around Capua. Marcellus, who had just reduced Syracuse, also retained his command as proconsul and would remain in Sicily with his legions. All of the soldiers defeated by Hannibal in the previous year were, quote, forbidden to winter in towns or to construct winter quarters for themselves within 10 miles of any town, end quote. Two entire fleets were ordered to patrol the coasts off of Sicily and Greece. Livy places the total number of vessels at 250, along with three entire legions dedicated for maritime purposes. Livy also indicates that Rome could field a total of 25 legions. The strategy was simple in Italy, offense against Capua and defense against Hannibal. The siege being conducted at Capua was beginning to take a serious toll on the population. Direct assault wasn't even needed as nothing could move in or out of Capua. The Capuans wanted to send messages to Hannibal, but the Romans kept an ever-watchful eye on all of the city's gates. The skirmishes occurred almost daily. The Romans got the better of the infantry skirmishes, but the Capuan cavalry gave the Romans constant problems. The Romans needed to find a way to counter the Capuan horse. Quote, young men of exceptional speed and agility were selected from all the legions and supplied with bucklers somewhat shorter than those used by the cavalry. Each was furnished with seven javelins that were four feet long and tipped with iron heads similar to those on the darts of the velite. The troopers each took one of these upon his horse and trained them to ride behind and leap down briskly at a given signal. As soon as their daily training had given them sufficient confidence, the cavalry advanced against the Capuans, who were drawn up on the level ground between the Roman camp and the city walls. As soon as they came within range, the signal was given and the velite sprang to the ground. The line of infantry thus formed made a sudden attack on the Capuan horse. Shower after shower of javelins was flung at the men and horses all along the line. A great many were wounded, and the novel and unexpected form of attack created widespread consternation. Seeing the enemy shaken, the Roman cavalry charged home, and in the route that followed they drove them with much loss right up to their gates. From that time, the Romans had the superiority in their cavalry also. End quote. Meanwhile, Hannibal had an important decision to make, attempt to take the citadel at Tarentum, or once again break the siege at Capua. In the end, Hannibal decided he could not allow Capua to fall to the Romans. He left part of his army at Brutium and headed north back to Campania. He established his camp in what Livy termed, quote, a secluded valley at the back of Mount Tifata, end quote. He dispatched a message to Capua informing them of the time he intended to attack the Roman lines, so that the Capuans could simultaneously launch an attack as well. Upon seeing Hannibal's army approaching from a distance, the Romans quickly divided up their army. Appius Claudius would deal with the Capuans, while Fulvius took the bulk of the army to confront Hannibal. Despite a ferocious onslaught, Appius was able to push the Capuans back. But Hannibal enjoyed far greater success and was able to penetrate deep into the Roman lines. The Roman legions under Fulvius had no choice but to fall back. Hannibal was on the verge of breaking directly into the Roman camp. Realizing the mortal danger the Roman camp faced, Fulvius implored his troops to fight on, despite the gravity of the situation. Meanwhile, Appius had pushed the Capuans all the way back to the city gate. Hannibal, who was already smashing through the Roman lines, decided to retire after news arrived that the Capuan attack had been broken and then repulsed. Total victory depended on success against both Roman armies. The next morning, the proconsuls were surprised to see the Carthaginian camp abandoned. Hannibal had marched on Rome. Fulvius immediately informed the Senate that Hannibal was on his way. The Senate convened an emergency session to decide what to do. Was Hannibal really going to march on Rome? Part of the Senate wanted to recall every Roman legion in Italy for an all-out defense of Rome, even if that meant abandoning the siege of Capua. However, as usual, Fabius urged calm. Perhaps no Roman ever understood Hannibal better than Fabius Maximus. Fabius was convinced this was all part of an elaborate ruse by Hannibal to get the Romans to break off their siege against Capua. With Hannibal, you must always think the opposite of what he really intends to do. Livy provides us Fabius's speech to the Roman Senate. Do you suppose that the man who did not venture to approach the city after his victory at Cannae really hopes to capture it now that he has been driven away from Capua? His object in coming here is not to attack Rome, but to raise the siege of Capua. The army which is now in the city will be sufficient for our defense, for it will be aided by Jupiter and the other gods who have witnessed Hannibal's violation of treaty engagements. 
In the end, the Senate heeded Fabius' advice and decided to exercise patience. For now, the Roman garrison would be sufficient in defense of the capital. The Senate also issued a decree that Fulvius and Appius could decide on their own what type of force was needed in the defense of Rome. They alone would decide how many legions needed to be dispatched to Rome, and the size of the force needed to maintain the siege at Capua. Fulvius thought it best to dispatch a force of 15,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry to Rome while the rest of the legions would maintain their positions around Capua. Hannibal did in fact cross the Volturnus, and not surprisingly immediately laid waste to the surrounding territory. He also burned the boats he used for the crossing so the Romans could not utilize them. He then pushed deep into the heart of Roman territory, making it as far as the Lyris River. But his march stalled after the Romans destroyed the Lone Bridge. Still, there was widespread panic in Rome with Hannibal in the vicinity of the capital. According to Livy, quote, the wailing city of the matrons was heard everywhere, not only in private houses, but even in the temples. Here they knelt and swept the temple floors with their disheveled hair and lifted up their hands to heaven in a piteous appeal to the gods, that they would deliver the city of Rome out of the hands of the enemy and preserve its mothers and children from injury and outrage. The Senate convened a session in the forum and decided to post guards all across the walls and capital. Meanwhile, Fulvius was on his way with an army from Capua. Fulvius, however, was not allowed to assume command of the forces inside Rome, since he was not a consul in 211 BC. In order to get around this technicality, the Senate granted Fulvius consular powers. By this time, Hannibal had established a camp just eight miles away from Rome. The Numidian scouts were sent ahead of the main army. They slaughtered and captured several Romans who were fleeing in terror. With the city in mortal danger, Fulvius finally arrived with his army and marched into Rome. Both Roman consuls were also camped nearby. Hannibal decided to increase the pressure and established a new base just three miles from the city. From this position, he took a body of 2,000 cavalry and actually pushed up to the Colleen Gate. The Senate remained in session as long as Hannibal posed a direct threat to Rome. It was decided that Fulvius would take command of the city, while the Roman consuls would remain camped with their armies near Rome. The next day, Hannibal offered battle. Fulvius and both consuls accepted. According to Livy, the coming battle would decide the fate of Rome, but a hailstorm sent both armies back to their respective camps. The next day, both sides drew up again, and once again, inclement weather interrupted the coming battle. Ironically, after both sides retired back to their camps, the weather cleared up. Hannibal finally decided to call off the attack and moved his army away from Rome. He entered Samnium and soon marched further south, back to Brutium. I think this act alone confirmed Fabius' suspicion that Hannibal all along never really intended to capture the capital. His real objective was to lure the Roman legions away from Capua. After Hannibal's departure, Fulvius returned to Capua and pressed on with the siege. This time, Hannibal made no attempt to interrupt the Romans. The Capuans were essentially left to their own fate. The Roman Senate issued a decree that any Capuan who surrendered would be granted full amnesty. But according to Livy, not a single Capuan took advantage of the offer, as they thoroughly distrusted the Romans. The Carthaginian garrison in Capua was left to command of what was surely a doomed city. They wanted to still send messengers to Hannibal. But how could they break through the Roman lines? The idea was to have some Numidians enter Fulvius's camp, posing as deserters. Then at the opportune time, the Numidians would make a break for it. Fulvius, however, discovered the plot and ordered all the hands of the Numidians cut off. The crippled Numidians were then sent back to Capua. This act alone sent terror through the streets of Capua. With no chance of contacting Hannibal, the Capuan Senate convened an emergency session. Many senators wanted to surrender with the hope the Romans might show some mercy. But Varius, who was the main senator opposed to the Romans, urged the Senate not to surrender. He said the following, I refuse to be dragged in chains through the streets of Rome to grace their triumph, and then in a dungeon or bound to the stake. I will not see my city plundered and burnt, and the matrons and maidens and noble boys of Capua ravished and outraged. Alba, the mother city of Rome, was raised by the Romans to its foundations in order that no memorial of their origin might survive. Much less can I believe that they will spare Capua, which they hate more bitterly than they hate Carthage. A rousing speech for sure, but by now the will of the Capuan Senate was broken, and the decision was made to unconditionally surrender the city. Varius left the Capuan Senate chambers and retired to his home. Many others who supported his position accompanied him as well. Varius held one final dinner, and near the end, a cup with poison was passed along to the guests. According to Livy, all were dead before Fulvius entered the city the next morning. After his legion was firmly situated in Capua, Fulvius immediately ordered the Capuans to surrender all their weapons. In addition, every entrance to the city was blocked so that no one could enter or leave. 
After the city was sealed off, he had all of the Carthaginians taken prisoner. Next, the Capuan Senate was ordered to hand over the city's treasury. After this task was complete, the Capuan senators were taken into custody. There was a debate about what to do with the Capuan senators. Appius Claudius wanted to pardon the senators, but Fulvius pushed for a harsh form of punishment. As the two generals debated about what to do, Appius Claudius suggested the Roman Senate should decide their fate. But Fulvius decided to take matters into his own hands and ordered the senators beheaded. Apparently, the Roman Senate had decreed that the prisoners were not to be executed, but it was all too late by the time Fulvius opened the letter. The remaining population was then sold into slavery. The decision was made not to raise Capua, but the government was effectively shut down. In effect, Capua became the property of Rome. Livy relates that, quote, it was settled that Capua itself should be simply a lodgment and a shelter, a city merely in name. There was to be no corporate life, no senate, no council of the plebes, no magistrates. The population was without any right of public assembly or self-government. They had no common interest and were incapable of taking any common action. The administration of justice was in the hands of a governor who was to be sent annually from Rome. The whole of Campania and all the surrounding nationalities would have been horror-struck at the destruction of such a famous and wealthy city. The enemy, on the other hand, was made to realize the power of Rome to punish those who were faithless to her, and the powerlessness of Hannibal to protect those who had gone over to him. So with the capture of both Syracuse and Capua, the war was now finally beginning to tilt Rome's way. It became even more important for Hannibal to hold on to Tarentum and establish a foothold in the south. In the next video, we will continue on with the year 211 BC.